going going to be presented by Tyson, Dr. Tyson, who has recorded his um um his presentations. So Tyson is academic researcher and art crit, uh, critic. So he he has done a lot of work in area of art and also area of research. So um. Very keen to hear from the presentation of Tyson. And after Tyson, we will have Richard, who is the uh, you know, most experienced person um, you know, in many areas, including the award winnings. Um, he has worked with the, with the Royal Commission looking at the the deaths of the Aboriginals and Terror States in custody. So he has done a lot of work. He's work in the military uh, as a soldier. He's also a fisherman and um, you know, multi, multi works in the in the community service. So with that note, I would like to um ask to play the uh the video for uh, Dr. Tyson, whom I work with in Naikiri before I moved to Melbourne University when I was at Deakin. So we do usually have a lot of interesting conversations. So um, Tyson will not make you guys bored. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, decolonizing um, spirituality is. I don't know it's a it's a it's a very large undertaking and probably deserves re-examination of some of those terms um yeah because there's decolonizing and there's a focus on colonization and colonies um but i think a force that's really strong in the world today and always has been is imperialism and it's probably better when we're talking about things on the scale of religions uh, particularly large monotheistic religions to reframe these things uh, from a point of view of imperialism um, and cultural economic and otherwise um, rather than just decolonization uh, decolonization is a quite an intensely localized point of view and um, there are larger um, structural forces afoot <laughs> that drive these colonies um, and you need to focus on those um, not just the localized experience of a colony um, although that's very important if you seek to affect change just locally without knowing the the deeper time point of view uh, from an indigenous viewpoint of history uh, without seeing the larger wider contexts um, of the structures and forces um, that oppress us, then you you, you miss out. Um, yeah, so I'm Tyson, uh, Tyson Yankapur. I belong to the Upledge clan. Um, I've actually just come home from a funeral. And, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I was uh, back up home for a week for a funeral, and I've just gotten back now. Um, it's three and a half thousand kilometers to the north of here. I'm on Bunurong country right now. The reason I mention this is just, um, I think it's relevant uh, the way our funerals um, are done uh, in my clan, uh, Upledge clan. That's um, it's like there are two funerals that happen. Um, there's the there's the traditional practice funeral that happens, you know, on one day, and then the next day there's the church funeral and the church funeral is very different um often that that can be a quite a dysfunctional kind of ceremony um and while it it reflects a lot of our own kind of practices and worldviews and uh you know uh, cultural ways of being and of knowing and understanding death um you know it's also at an interface with uh, large globalizing monotheistic Abrahamic religion um, and you know if there's dysfunction that's where it arises and so that's something I've been navigating for the past week um, 
Yeah, the traditional funeral that happened before that, that's, that's a very different thing. And, and it's a very unifying thing in a way of bringing everybody together in a more distributive kind of uh, consciousness, um, whereby people can deal with grief, you know, collectively. Um, the second day is different. You know, the grief is often individualized there. And I don't know, I find that day always is quite traumatic. Um, so that's from that spiritual point of view at the local level. When we look at decolonization, you know, decolonization has efforts have always been leveraged uh, by the powerful since some um, since empires began, you know, um, uh, you know, resistance and decolonizing efforts, you know, from the occupied culture are always leveraged uh, from afar by other imperial powers um, in order to shift a balance of power. And shift ownership of these client states, um, which Australia is pretty much a client state, uh, to shift ownership of that client state to a different imperial power. Um, so, you know, our modern theoretical understandings of decolonization of, uh, came out of, you know, um, uh, post Second World War, when all the maps of the world were redrawn, new nations were formed. Um, by just a handful of people in a room who just arbitrarily drew a bunch of borders and, and um, decided what was a country and what wasn't a country anymore and all these sorts of things. Um, basically, you know, um, the effort there was to redistribute all of the colonies, um, you know, to basically um, uh, divest these European countries of their, you know, colonial sort of client states or, um, you know, properties, um, and to use, use the, uh, the resistance of the occupied cultures in those, uh, countries, uh, to leverage that action. Um, so that occurred over a number of decades following the second world war, um, where basically the power in the world, the imperial power shifted from European countries, um, to the new sort of global hegemony coming out of the United States. Um, we all did the heavy lifting for that. Um, you found that a lot of those decolonizing um, leaders and movements, you know, were supported initially, uh, but soon found themselves um, <laughs> in a lot of deep caca after the um, decolonizing efforts had occurred. Not many of them survived the aftermath of uh, decolonization and once they'd won their their uh, sovereignty back uh, that was quickly eroded and you found there was a lot of um you know puppet governments installed um lots of proxy wars started um there were lots of genocides heaps of genocides and killings and uh, new governments installed and the people who really ran the resistance efforts of decolonization um, most of them ended up being killed um, assassinated uh, replaced um, or at best they were um, they were expelled uh, <laughs> and sort of had to go and live somewhere else banished elsewhere uh, if they were lucky um, so that was decolonization 1.0 Decolonization 2.0 has been a, um, an, an, a, an effort grounded in postmodernism, post-structuralism, whereby we don't see the structures and we don't see the systems of imperialism, uh, where we focus our attention inwards and locally. Uh, we center the voices of the marginalized, the oppressed, the colonized, the occupied. Um, we recenter those voices and we recenter those standpoints. Um, and we focus on the idea of regaining power through our voice um, and providing alternative narratives, all these sorts of things. Um, as long as we don't, <laughs> we never address or even see the actual structures of systemic inequality. Systemic inequality isn't just, you know, like a toxic culture of an organization whereby there is a, an aggregate of, you know, uh, individual bigots and um, bigoted or prejudiced worldviews that sort of add up to a culture of, um, you know, racism, etc. Um, but this is how we've been dealing with things in decolonization 2.0. 
Uh, we seldom address the structures. Um, in our indigenous lenses, our indigenous standpoints, indigenous methodologies, uh, we always are um, utilizing a local, in, localized indigenous lens and a very subjective, um, often even individualistic sometimes, um, lens of a person's individual sort of group identity or set of intersectionalities that provide their worldview and retelling um, narratives from that point of view, um, sharing experience, recording experience, doing a lot of descriptive research, um, you know, uh, critical race theory when it was <laughs> in its actual form um, was more looking at the structures of racism. You know, you look at things like, um, you know, real estate zoning, you know, market forces, the way these things are policed, the way these things are, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's more looking at the real structural things, the economic um, factors, you know, the actual still existing imperialism that, um, uh, that serves to marginalize people not through bigotry or anything else but you know um, you, you, through those through those economic structures um, and particularly utilizing land as capital uh, real estate zoning all these things I think that's the core of it and the way those things are enforced um, the way property and capital is protected for you know um, oligarchs and you know an extremely privileged minority um, these are the places where our attention needs to be and if we're thinking about spirituality um you know most of the world's spirituality now is mediated is filtered through uh, monotheistic religions very large monocultural monotheistic religions um and these are problematic um you know the the majority of these are like quite you know the ones that are impacting the planet the most are the abrahamic religions um you know and these are coming out of you know decolonization efforts of people who were occupied you know so if you start with the the jews you know for example which is the root culture of this you have people who were horrendously oppressed for millennia um you know uh, so by you, you had people who were initially a pastoral culture with a very um like a wonderful spirituality um but then as they moved away from pastoralism more into sedentary civilized civilization they did what all sedentary civilizations do which is create more of a monotheistic cult um the purpose of this is to um uh to increase the sphere of trust uh for an economy in trade uh this is done through contracts now so in the old days there were no ways to enforce contracts beyond the local unless you had a large monotheistic religion um, into frighten people basically into um, honoring those contracts. So if you can get enough people beyond just your city uh, all following the same religion, um, this began with Hammurabi, um, the Co Hammurabi's code in Samaria, um, this sort of the technology, the psychotechnology of religion was pretty much invented there in the Fertile Crescent. Um, and that, uh, that technology, you know, was all about getting enough people believing in this, uh, this single massive, you know, uh, creation entity, uh, this omnipotent, all seeing, all knowing, all powerful entity, uh, that would know if you were lying or cheating. So, and that was invented alongside contracts. Now, contracts are a way or a technology that is a way of controlling and predicting events in the future and um, ensuring that you can guarantee the behavior of a person in honoring that contract. Now, in the original contracts, um, there was usually built into that an oath. And that oath would be like similar to how court, how testimony happens in courts still today, is that that is sworn to an on, omnipotent deity. So the idea is if you don't honor that contract, the deity will punish you. Um, so this is what you saw coming out in um, Israel and around Jerusalem. Um, and it's, it's as much for trade as anything else. Um, now, Jerusalem uh, is occupied by um, Babylon. You know, the people are, are taken out, you know, and, and, and spend the next millennia returning and, and then being occupied over and over 
you know, begins with Babylon, then the Persians invade, then the Greeks invade after that, then the Romans invade after that, after they make, you know, Greece into a client state as well, and the rest of the known world. Um, so you end up with people who are persecuted over and over and over again, occupied over and over and over again, you know, an indigenous people essentially. Now, when that kind of imperial trauma keeps happening to a culture, um, the spirituality of that culture tends to develop a pretty negative outlook. <laughs> um, you, what arises in your religion and your spirituality then is apocalyptic uh, prophecies. You know, it feels like it's the end of the freaking world. And the only way you can continue is to imagine that there is some force, some power of spirit that is going to restore you and that is going to punish the people that have oppressed you and occupied your lands and destroyed your your culture and your community and taken your children as slaves, um, uh, assimilated your children into a, a larger imperial economy um, that's basically destroyed your sovereignty and made you dependent on this large economy of this empire. So what you have coming down in all the Abrahamic religions coming from that is always end times prophecies. You have uh, a culture of, of uh, a rapture, basically, um, a rapture ideology emerging from all these. And every time when hard times start to come around, the rapture ideologies increase. And we can see this, you know, still happening today. Um, uh, so you, you end up uh, in the United States, particularly, uh, but all around the world, a lot of different um, rapture ideology cults emerging and becoming religions in their own right. Um, and these things see the only hope for the future in an end of times, an end of the world. A complete destruction of everything where everything will be wiped clean and you know the people who imagine who are oppressed or even imagine themselves as being oppressed are somehow raptured are taken up and given their ultimate reward and that their enemies will be punished so you end up with um, you know this idea of you know um, power as something that people need to be able to seize, you know, in their community. Uh, so, you know, the power of, of, a, of an all-seeing God, but also the power of a government, you know, which is, you know, sanctified um, by this God. Uh, the power of a government, uh, which is there to punish your enemies um, and to ensure your privilege and continuation into another world. Uh, this is what we see all around the world at the at the moment. This is what we see, like, particularly in the United States, but spreading out to everywhere. Uh, you see coming through all of these apocalyptic cults, um, which are uh, they are emerging as a kind of conspiracy conspiracy narratives. Now, your conspiracy narratives always have a spiritual element, so uh, we refer to those now in our research as conspirituality. Um, uh, and this is good story, you know, because a lot of the stories for the world and the history that we're presented with and the news and the media that we get for all of our uh, knowledge of global events, um, it, it's not very good story. There's never spirit is never part of it. <laughs> so all of these big narratives emerge you know, which is about good and evil, heaven and earth, um, angels and demons, you know, people who are vaccinated are demons now, people who, you know, um, uh, who are female and want to control their own bodies, they are demons, um, you know, so there's a kind of all or nothing thing that's contributed to a massive, just irreparable divide, where there's just one extreme on one side, one extreme on the other, and each thinks the other is the source of the end of the world and are demonic entities uh, that must be destroyed. This narrative has become attractive in our indigenous communities. And a lot of us have wanted to deny this for a really long time. Um, but, you know, over the last decade, um, a lot of our community members, even our elders, a lot of people in indigenous communities in Australia have become red-pilled 
to these um, conspirituality kind of narratives. Um, you know, a lot of us uh, are believing a lot of the disinformation around vaccines, for example, and that has been reported, but not a lot of the other stuff. I mean, we have we have Aboriginal MAGA, like Make America Great Again, Trump supporters, you know, who believe that Trump is touched by the hand of God and is here to, you know, uh, punish the enemies of God. Um, is a lot of people who believe, I mean, it's easy to believe it if you've lived through stolen generations and you're in a reality where more kids are being taken from Aboriginal families and Torres Strait Islander families than at any other time in Australia's history. It's easy to believe that there is some force somewhere, some conspiring demonic group who is taking children and draining them from their blood and drinking their blood and torturing them and abusing them um, because for a lot of us that is actually our reality um, so when we get these narratives from overseas that are about you know satanic forces uh, you know taking children and and you know uh, drinking their blood and um, abusing them and you know trafficking them and all these sorts of things um, which is usually projected onto like one political party, like oh, that you know, Democrats, they they're run by Satan and they, <laughs> etc. And they're all groomers or they're all this or all that. You get these really absolutist kind of narratives and factions emerging, and we're not immune to that. I know a lot of our elders who are have been sucked into these things, um, really quite badly. Um, and we're going to have to reckon with that at some stage. Um, you know, uh, these narratives are informing a lot of the geopolitics, you know, in the world right now. It's particularly terrifying when you think that these are all coming from rapture ideologies, uh, from religions that are basically always sitting in anticipation of the end of the world. We have to recognize that that is what always emerges from systemic imperial abuse. You know, um, if you occupy lands and cultures and you continue to abuse those lands and cultures over time, then, you know, those lands and cultures are going to adopt um, apocalyptic narratives and prophecies, are going to long for an end of the world so the pain can stop are going to long for a time when the righteous will be uplifted and their oppressors will be punished. Um, the worst thing that you see with this is a lot of white minorities uh, globally, um, uh, white supremacist groups who are uh, pushing a narrative of what they call the great replacement. This idea that, um, that it's actually Europeans who are being oppressed, you know, by all these colored people around the world and that somehow the Jews are running that and that there's this big conspiracy to replace them and that there's these di demonic forces and that we need the white hats to rise up or something like this. Um, so, you know, you have these rapture ideologies with white supremacist movements who have compounds and militias and they're armed to the teeth and they bomb abortion clinics and they assassinate abortion doctors um, and abortion providers everywhere. They um, uh, just doing <laughs> the most horrendous acts of terrorism that somehow managed to fly under the radar and are not focused on. Um, but anyway, so you have these white supremacist memes, these white supremacist groups um, who are all fueled by this, you know, kind of religious, ecstatic, you know, end times, you know, um, ideology. Um, these people um, are very well organized and they manage to install people at the absolute highest levels of power. Um, you know, uh, particularly through the previous uh, Trump administration, you saw even right all the way up to Mike Pence and the Secretary of State. These were all uh, religious extremists um, who were homeschooled within a global network uh, curriculum that, you know, basically made all... I trained all these kids from a young age to be warriors of God. Um, this is a massive problem. It's it's bigger than you can imagine. Um, and the strangest thing 
is that these white supremacist groups are managing to conscript a lot of people of color and a lot of indigenous groups all around the world, even in Australia. Um, it is a very big problem. They have very attractive narratives, very attractive memes, um, and they regard white people as being an oppressed minority um, that needs to somehow regain power and punish the enemies of God. Um, this always emerges. This is always the response of power. Um, it, it's basically, um, this is funded by dark money um, uh, that often comes through extreme right think tanks, um, but also a lot of other organizations. This is funded by dark money from people like the Koch brothers, etc., who are, um, you know, uh, massive oligarchs who want to create as much disruption as possible and make sure that, um, you know, people don't organize around, I don't know, billionaires paying some taxes, um, organize around things like, you know, social justice and creating, you know, a safe world for people to live in and all these things that are not good for the bottom line of the people who are extracting from the planet. They like us to look elsewhere to things other than the structural inequality they like for us all to have um, alternative narratives and you know for us to be distracted by um, insane cult ideologies <laughs> that are going to direct us to do the heavy lifting for them uh, for them to be able to retain their power um, that's pretty much where we're at um, we don't have a colony problem we still do as always have an empire problem and religion and spirituality is just one of the tools that they can leverage uh, in order to maintain those systems of power. And it's, um, it's time to take another look, people. And also apology. Um, just wanted to withdraw my word that I said um, Tyson will not make you, um, you know, bored. <laughs> but unfortunately, because of technology, the thing did not work the way um, the way we wanted or the way we planned it. So now um, we need to give the opportunity to um, Richard. It's your turn. That will be great. And I failed to mention before, both Tyson and Richard are from our First Nation people in this country. So um, so there, there, there's a lot of similarity that may come out uh, from their presentations. So uh, Richard, take it over. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. Uh, can we hear me? Um, yes, I can. Oh, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, no worries. Um, I was going to just uh, uh, do a bit of a presentation if that's all right um so firstly let me pay my respect to traditional owners past and present and to all of you here um and thanks very much for having me um i'm a gundi jamara fella uh and i celebrate a lot of cultures i'm a very lucky person um and i've been a, a first line activist um in a lot of different areas. I um, grew up under the assimilation policies, which is quite difficult. When I was a young man, about 25, I was investigating deaths in custody for the Royal Commission, and it was a difficult job. I covered two and a half states, and they renewed the contract every three months. I did that for four years, investigating police and prison officers and the system itself. Uh, it was a, an emotionally and spiritually and violent role. Um, I went to a dinner party and it was the first one I'd ever been to as a First Nation person. Um, and I remember clearly a woman on the, on the way there, I, there was an act of violence against me. And um, I'd seen a lot of violence in Australia, racial violence. Um, at the dinner party, a woman knocked over a glass of red wine and said to me, so tell me, why do your people kill themselves in jail? And three things struck me. 
The first was uh, your people. So in the words of Marcy Langton, we were the undifferentiated other. The second thing was the assumption that everybody killed themselves, and this simply wasn't the case. Um, the third was that um, the tone of voice indicated really clearly to me that our misery uh, was an uncomfortable situation for her, but nothing that she would actively do to try and prevent it. That led me to believe that what we were fighting was something I call social conditioning, meaning people had been trained to think and act a certain way towards First Nation Australians, towards anybody that was not the norm, so to speak. So I started to think the way to kill the snake, the snake of discrimination, was to cut the head off. And so I wanted to unravel the cultural tapestry of a nation and somehow weave it back together. And to do that, I had to get into people's lounge And so I started to use the arts to challenge this social conditioning, this training that we'd all been subjected to. So today I'm going to speak from um, an artist or an arts activist role. And my credo is, I, I believe, when you have art, you have voice. And with voice comes freedom. And with that freedom comes a responsibility not just to yourself and your personal belief, but to us as a collective, um, meaning black, white or brindle. I want to also speak um, with this premise that Cook never landed on Australia. Cook landed on um, many Aboriginal nations and tribes, but there was no Australia. And as uh, Patrick Wolf now deceased says, um, invasion is a structure and not an event. So Cook is still landing on us in many, many, many different ways. This is what Cook landed on. And this is the Gundijmara people, my mob. And as you can see, it means strikingly handsome, Greek-looking Aboriginal. Uh, it looks, it's a better joke if I'm there in the room. Sorry. Uh, this is um, what was alleged within the education system and within the common mentality of people that Cook discovered. In fact, it was this what Cook landed on, hundreds of nations with trade systems with a whole range of um, social order. This social order was a multitude of languages, trading systems, uh, law, dispute resolution processes, a law circle, which uh, this is something I designed a while ago. And this was the structure, not for all tribes, but for many, of how we existed with each other. And when one of these is damaged, it damages um, many others. This is um, some of the villages down home, villages and towns. Pre-contact, there were villages of 3,000 plus people, which in Western Eurocentric terms constitutes a town. Um, and as you can see, we had um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of these villages. Um, the villages were destroyed at um, invasion onwards, at the point of, from first contact onwards. Uh, so was our farming, um, our aquaculture. And a range of things. A lot of the village, the villages were torn up, and the um, it's reputed that a lot of the um, uh, buildings were used to make roads. These are the services, uh, very basic services that you can see, um, and they um, they uh, the interpretation of what is a service differs with uh, cultural interpretation. There were dispute resolution processes. Um, um, uh, contrary to the stereotyped belief, um, the worst punishment was exile from the community, not so much a physical punishment, but physical, not as in the spearing or beating, but um, being exiled from your community. 
this is the shape of a Nunanjeri, uh, which is a neighboring tribe dispute settlement process. And it was also a parliamentary system. I'm showing you this to give you an indication of uh, the destruction that um, ensued after uh, the beginning of colonization or the cultural bomb as Ngugi Tiongo puts it. These are the six seasons of my mob. Um, as you can see, we're in Chunup uh, cockatoo season. This is pretty cold time. Um, we'll be moving into Lanyuk and Pechan and Balamba or Parambil um, season. Um, Pechan is my favorite season. Um, Ngugi Tiongo, this amazing Kenyan intellectual, says that when uh, the colonizers come, they drop a cultural bomb on us and then convince everybody, including the First Peoples, that uh, their past before that point of contact is a cultural wasteland. This is a devastating thing that knocks us all about in a whole heap of ways. And it creates a cultural divide and uh, an us and them type of attitude. W.E.H. Stanner did a speech in 1969 um, called The Great Australian Silence. It was one of the Boyer lectures. And he spoke about three key points, which to my mind still exist today. Homelessness, um, which again was reinforced by a legal fiction. Um, uh, disconnect, we were disconnected from our country. Powerlessness, no lack of acknowledgement of our authorities or our structures. Uh, poverty. So no recognition of our economies um, and a limited access to the dominant culture, which in the context of colonialism um, limits our involvement or our growth. A disorientational confusion. So we've got no place to fit and our clear roles that we once had um, would, were taken. As we can see from this, um, we can see that this is ongoing. It, it didn't begin and end um, as an event. It's a structure which is still around. And the role of many of us, in particular artists, is to try and conform that access point um, to the wealth and power of society so that we all fit through. This created five primary traumas for First Nation people. Um, the transgenerational trauma or intergenerational trauma, discrimination trauma, which when we look at the studies of Vic Health, we can see that 98% of First Nation people encounter some type of um, discrimination at least eight times a year. The cultural load trauma, this refers to the complexity of our lives and the amount of grief, funerals, chronic illness, incarceration. The lateral violence trauma, Biko, Steve Biko, the wonderful activist, says that the greatest weapon of the oppressors are the minds of the oppressed. And what happens is we don't punch upwards. We end up uh, striking out at each other. And people see this and think that we haven't got it together. And one of the most complex, which I experience all the time, is how do we navigate the dominant culture? And that, that creates a trauma in itself. There's another one called vicarious trauma, um, which is the retelling of these types of stories. The traumas compound together and create a super trauma when we are confronted with things like bushfires and other types of trauma. So how I navigate trauma and my trauma recovery process is utilising the arts. And I created a... Uh, I, I, I work in many disciplines, but I created a process and a mindset. Um, and the mindset is that we have to defuse the cultural bomb. We have to reseed the cultural wasteland. And we must see clearly how our brothers and sisters are doing this already. And by brothers and sisters, I don't mean just First Nation people. I mean all of us. And very importantly, we must also recognise how we are doing this uh, with ourselves, not just within ourselves, but how we're physically actively doing this. I use this type of strategy, the five W's and the H, to perpetually analyse how I'm doing this type of stuff. Again, I come back to the law circle and I use this to remind myself and ground myself um, 
and this is a very basic one. We don't really have time for me to go through it, but I'm happy to for people to contact me and to walk them through it at some point. But essentially, they want to change the Western Eurocentric system wants us to change our cultural shape to fit into all of these different silos, and that can be quite uh, traumatic. And this is part of navigating the dominant culture. And this tells us clearly, in my opinion, why we need um, First Nation organisations, programs, institutions, and reclamation of, in particular, reclamation and maintenance of cultural programs. Muriel Bamblett, who's the head of the Victorian Aboriginal Childcare Agency, says that um, basically there's three points to culture about meaning and identity. One, everybody's got culture. Um, two is we all need culture. Otherwise, we end up creating subcultures, uh, which can be good and bad. And three is we're seen um, by the broader world um, within our cultural framework or our cultural setting. And that, again, can be good and bad. Um, once we had cultural safety, and cultural safety is the ability to practice our identity, um, our culture, without any challenge or denial on who and what we are. And it's also about shared respect and shared meaning. This term came about um, from the Maori nursing fraternity. And we use it, we, a lot of our organisations and institutions use cultural safety as a way to change the lens of the dominant culture. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. I, I did a study where I interviewed 131 people uh, with a team of people um, asking 90 questions as, across six communities. Again, I'm happy to make um, that, that the outcome of that research available to people if they like. This is uh, Patrick Wolf, who I referred to before. And we see clearly that he says that um, invasion is a structure, not an event. Uh, and we live with a nursery version of history in Australia. Um, it's changing. I'm really great, grateful for that. Um, but we weren't told about the massacres and the battles and the wars and the destruction. Uh, it's quite an interesting um, approach by the colonisation process. So we also live with a lot of cultural loads, and this is quite often invisible to our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters, and sometimes to our own. And Steve Biko, the greatest weapon of the oppressors are the minds of the oppressed. So I use art as a resistance and capacity building tool, and I call it cultural strengthening as well. Um, I use it to facilitate voice. Um, there's a whole heap of songs and poetry and films and theatre that I've done. I use it to maintain uh, culture and also to retrieve culture. Um, I've recently uh, doing I'm doing a deal where I'm building a, a Tomorrow Australia or a healing centre on three acres that I'm going to license to um, a group. And the purpose of that is a train the trainer in um, trauma recovery processes using cultural strengthening and using art. Um, it's a, a daring venture. I don't know how I don't know how I'm going to go, but I've been having a crack at it for about five years. Uh, so my family and I are uh, licensing three acres on Gundij Mara country to try and get this going. I'm happy to say deacons, um, there's pockets of deacon who are interested in supporting it as well. So the problem is here we are, the First Nation people, trying to get through this access point to the wealth and power of equity and justice and voice. And all of this is in the shape of the dominant culture, a different shape to me and my life and the things that I experience as a First Nation person. And what we do, what we academics do and artists and a whole range of people is we try and work out why these pathways are dangerous and why this is in such a dominant cultural shape. And we try and work out ways to change it. Really, it's about changing what is wealth and power in many regards. Uh, and there you go. That's uh, how we get stopped. So we see that there was a different idea about wealth and power. Um, and this has changed a lot. And there's uh, more and more people who are looking at 
um, these types of uh, things as a wealth and power. And so I see this social change happening in Australia. Um, there's a, there were heaps of crossovers. Um, and now what I see is um, this glass ceiling where um, in the Victorian government, as an example, there's 1,500 First Nation people employed, all in, identif or not all, but 90 plus percent in identified positions. Um, it's hard to be employed as a human when you're First Nation. You are often in identified positions. Again, it gets stopped. I got through. I had a film at Cairns in the 90s, I think it was. Uh, but in Australia, uh, I could only get films with Aboriginal subject or content matter until I ended up being um, able to direct uh, a show called Blue Healers. Um, and I was in culture shock that I was hired as a human. Um, there's a whole heap of barriers to success uh, that uh, we call the glass ceiling. This is from a study I did in 2009 um, with a group of people, First Nation people mainly, um, where they felt they were often in positions uh, doomed to fail. Um, we see that there's a lot of structural violence um, and that this is an ongoing thing. Um, lateral violence is one of the biggest things that we face. This is an example of what's happened to us in relation to social order. So pre-contact, we were able to move up the Maslow hierarchy of need quite easily. Um, invasion meant that many of these things were taken away and we were placed on missions um, or became fringe dwellers and became voiceless in a whole heap of ways. In fact, became invisible. Um, just checking, there's a chat there. Oh, there we go. Um, so we can see that um, uh, one of the concepts I have is we return to a First Nation culturally safe society. But we can't do that alone. Um, and we can't do that in isolation. So I believe that there's a we need a co-creation of post-invasion environments where all of us... Um, move together and i call that concept tomorrow australia um to achieve this we need to we need actions that combat racism lateral violence and pro promotes and re uh, adequately resources um, cultural solutions i use these as my tools um, i also do a lot of community capacity building work i go into communities sometimes there's a lot of suicides there uh, other times I do a lot of um, general support work um, in advice and strategic advice, and I work with institutions a lot. Um, this is an example of some of the work I'm doing. Um, this is, um, a, I'm working with a lady called Amanda Hitton, who's um, designing some stage performance clothing. And these cultural icons that you can see, um, my tribe, the Gundij Mara people, have the black cockatoo and the white cockatoo. Um, so we're putting these on some of the stage uh, things I'll wear. I've got a new album coming out. Um, and they, it'll be these types of things which will be painted on and pressed on, on uh, the sleeves. And there'll also be the inner lining of a jacket. These are all symbols from my mob. Um, I ask them to put colour in them. To uh, They mean a whole heap of things from meeting place to... Uh, pathways to uh, other meeting places to the sun to um, uh, rivers and so on um, this is the song i did called malcolm smith which was picked up by the new york resistance choir and sung um, by a whole heap of ladies and they asked permission to change some of the lyrics to include a couple of deaths in custody over there uh, george floyd being one of them I don't think we've got time to play this. Um, and I'll, oops, I've started playing it.
How is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I was saying uh, thank you, uh, Professor Richard. We can hear it. Oh, thank you. You can't. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah. uh, so this is um, there's two more items I'll talk about then pass over. Sorry. Uh, this is uh, a, another poem. This is an idea of uh, collaboration. Jack Thompson. Yeah, so you can pass it to heart. Just yeah, keep going with your presentation. Yeah. Um, so Jack Thompson is um, a famous actor, and he read out a poem um, I wrote, which uh, you won't be able to hear, I don't think. Um, so I won't um, play it. And this is uh, oh, sorry. This is another one, uh, a poem about tomorrow, Australia, which is about a vision I have for tomorrow. The premise of that vision or the foundation is if I have non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters and I'm doing, let's say, a totem naming day ceremony, the idea is why can't their children join me? That's the essence of, uh, of my presentation. I, um, to, to me, one of the ways to decolonise, if you like, is to expose the past for what it truly is so that we can actually handle what we're dealing with here in contemporary times. But most importantly, so that we can create a future together. Um, we have to, we have difficult things to navigate, but we need a, a common vision for victory that enables all of us to have a home. Otherwise we, we end up excluding each other. And, that contributes to a nasty disease called discrimination. I hope this has helped um, you guys get an understanding of a First Nation person's lens on the situation we face. Um, so I, I offer much love and support and say thank you very much for hearing me. Oh, I can't hear you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, and it is a nice way of closing it, killing the disease, um, the discrimination disease, or it's, a, it's just a nice way. Now, I wanted to invite people to...